Hallelujah. Amen. Some lovely songs there today, wasn't there? Just <coughs> ministering to Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. You know, one of the one of the things that really helped me as a new Christian uh, was when I began to understand. We've got next few weeks Easter coming up in early April. And when I think about it, I began to understand as a new Christian what had taken place. And one of the scriptures that really helped me, because how many know, before we get saved, we're brought up in a, a religious atmosphere. And what I mean by that is like, we want to please God, so we want to do more. And we think God's going to bless us when we do that extra bit. And I, I, be, I come to learn that what the church calls that, when I say the church, the body of Christ, is works. And we learn that we're not saved by works. And I, I want to read this. It's nothing to do with my sermon. It's just, it's just a thought. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, listen to this. I want you to grasp this into your spirit, man. Talking about Jesus, and, and Paul says, For he who knew no sin, that's Jesus, he that, excuse me, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And what that means, he took our sin upon his body on the cross. And the reason he did that, he said that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now that's a big impact on us. I've preached this sermon, it's called Divine Exchange. He takes our sin, our sinful nature, this is what the crucifixion was all about. He took our sin upon his body on the cross. And guess what he did? He exchanged it for his righteousness. And so we can rightly and gladly say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Yes. The Bible said it's not by works of righteousness that you have done, but by his mercy and grace he saved us. Someone needed to hear that this morning. Amen. I did. Yeah. Remind myself many times, yeah. especially when I feel I'm not pleasing God in actions and thoughts and, mm -hmm. and deeds, mm -hmm. because we tend to think the devil and the flesh will say, "Oh, you've done it again," you know. And, and it, it's not—that's not saying we just say, "Oh, well, it, it's okay." It's not okay to live unrighteous, but let the you know, let the Holy Spirit through the Word minister to us in them times. Because we're born again, we're saved. We've done the divine exchange. Anyway, let's get to the sermon today. We're, we're coming to the end of our series. I keep saying that, but I keep thinking it, but then something else pops up. And even though I've called this series Attitudes, it really should have been called Choices, choosing, because uh, each one he, he starts off with choosing. We looked at the very beginning was uh, choosing hope when you feel hopeless, and then we looked at choosing compassion when you feel content, when you don't want to feel compassion on people. Helps to remind us. The Apostle Paul says these words, said, There by the grace of God go I. Yes. So when we see that beggar on the street, where we see that uh, struggling person, where we see the sick in the hospital, you know, there by the grace of God go I. Amen. It's not because we're better. It's not because God chose you over them. Because that's how we tattered. 
work it out in our lives. Then we looked at choosing gratitude. Denise spoke about it this morning, giving thanks. Give, choosing gratitude when you feel unsatisfied. Mm. These are all things that you have to, actions you have to take. Yes. Yeah. Choices. Choosing humility when you feel like it's all about you. See, pride likes to pop up in our lives, doesn't it? And we end up keeping up with the Joneses. That's just pride. Jesus. Yes. God, can, God has a way of you uh, humbling us. I nearly said you really ain't in the second one. Last week, we looked at choosing joy when you feel down and out. Yeah. You know, when we say things to God, or we say things in our life, I should say, God hears us, doesn't he? And when we make statements, God will test us on it. And I was just saying to someone today that since Christmas, I've had to stand in faith with Denise and with the church for many things. Yes. Family, church, self, yes. finances, yes. you know, food, whatever it is. It seems to, you know, you just get the victory in one area and guess what? It's like that, that it's like that um, stacking system on the, on the telephone, you know. There's five people before you. And you just, you know, you have to, and it seems to be like, oh, we've got the victory here, we've got that job, and then something else comes up. It's relentless, the devil doesn't give up. But we've got to choose that we're on the victory side. Yes, Jesus. And I've been learning that through, through the last few uh, months when I got sick and I got a virus and it, it floored me really. And people say, Now you do, you know, you're preaching healing, you pray for healing. I am, and I'm still believing it. Yeah, I'm believing I overcome it. But guess what? If I don't overcome it, I know where I'm going. I'm not planning on going there just yet, but it's in God's hands. Choosing joy when we we don't, you know, we feel out of it. This all comes down to choices. And you're only going to make the right choice when you've got the right information. So that means we need to be in God's Word. We need to go over these messages on, on YouTube or Christine puts up and, 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 you know, just keep going over it. Read the Word of God. I was telling my sister the other day, she's not a Christian as we understand it. She's a believer in, in God, and you know, just like we were before we got saved. But she's not had a, a born again experience. And I was explaining to her how difficult it is to try and live for God without the knowledge of the Word. Mm. It's like trying to pass your test without doing the highway code. Mm. 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 That's right. You know, and, and it stops a lot of people learning the highway code because, you know, we just rather get dry. Are, are you still driving? No. <laughs> anyway, while you're not driving, learn the highway code. It'll help you when you go back to it. Because you'll know what, you know, you know what used to stump me most was the, the, the yellow lines on the road, the double yellow lines, the single yellow lines, the broken yellow lines. I used to think, what on earth is, you know, can I park it or can I not? Someone said to me one time, it's easy. The more paint, the more restriction. <laughs> that's, and that's how I learn it. If it's, you know, stay away from double yellow lines. But when I learned how I made code and passed my test, it was glorious. I must admit, I failed it the first time. And I feel ashamed to tell you what I failed on. They failed me on dangerous driving. <laughs> I was on a double decker bus. You know. I was dry, I passed my test on a double decker bus. I never drove a car. And 
you know, I think it over exaggerated it. Now. <laughs> I went through. I went through when um, Market Street used to be uh, for traffic, yeah. and I'm thinking I didn't want to stop. You see, because it was going uphill, and I didn't want to do a hill start because it was a crash <laughs> box. It wasn't automatic, and I, and I got to this first set of lights and. It went on amber and I went through and I got to the second one and thought, he's on amber. I went through and went through and he said, take it back to the depot. <laughs> the class that was dangerous driving. Which it was. But I passed the next time. Amen. I had to go on and, and spend many hours just learning that. Because you don't know what they're going to ask you. They're very crafty, aren't they? They don't ask you every question that you've learned. They only, they've got random ones in here, doesn't it? So, but you've got to learn every one because you don't know which ones he's going to ask you. Yeah. Anyway, the same in the, thing, in the kingdom of God. If, if you don't know what you're supposed to know, how do you know the answer? Yeah. So, let me encourage you. Get into the word. Amen. Don't try and read big chunks of it if you're new to it. Amen. Get a, a chapter a day. A little bit little bit Hallelujah. and today okay we're going to move on today and uh, it's called choosing resilience when you feel like giving up this could be a good one for you today because I believe we've all been there haven't we we're not just talking about faith I'm talking about ready to give up and throw in the towel Maybe on your profession, maybe a calling, maybe a family. Maybe even your own life. I've heard many stories over the years in, in the job, in, in the job I worked in and in ministry. I've heard so much more. When I was first sent out with Denise to pastor in Birmingham, when I say pastor, it was a pioneer where we had to start from scratch. <coughs> and we used to go knocking, drop the kids off at school, go knocking on doors, especially on a Saturday when we give out tracks. And anybody responded to it, or we go knocking, we'd follow them up. And then we'd knock on doors, and then anyone who gave us a response in any way, we'd, we'd follow it up. But we began to get to know people on the estates where we, the, the church was. And some of the things people go through. You said to me, I thought I'd had a bad life till I met these people. And I remember phoning back to the, 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 the mother church and the past, our pastor and saying, how's it going? I said, oh, how do I handle this? I've never heard people go through these kind of things. Say, welcome to ministry. <laughs> well, we, we met people that were beat up in life. And they were some were ready to end their life. Others were ready to end the marriage, end the job, you know. And I'm sure we've all been in a point where we wanted to give up. And I've said this before in times past. The problem is, most of us want to give up just short of our breakthrough. Yeah. How can I explain that? This is like the Bible or a storybook. And it's like you're on page 99 and you want to give up. You've prayed about it, you've asked God. You've asked for that miracle, you've asked for that increase, you've asked for that life partner, or whatever it is, and it's not come forth, and you're ready to give up, or you do give up, not knowing on the very next page is your miracle, no. is the answer to your prayer. Yes. And that's the game that the devil wants to play. He wants to stop you and I from going forward. And he'll do it through discouragement, and as, as Christians, it needs resilience. It needs that stickability. Yes. Yes. 
first Christian conference we ever went to it was at Butlins. It's a Christian camp for the week. And we went into the evening service and, and it was, we went into the, we're in a kind of catch-22. We was a little bit too old for the youth meetings. We was 23. And we felt too young for the older meetings. But at this night we found ourselves in one and this song impacted my life so much that I keep telling everyone about it. And he, he used to sing, Don't give up, you're on the brink of a miracle. Yes. Don't give in, God is still on the throne. And he went on like that. And he, I, I still remember that. Don't give up, you're on the brink of a miracle. The next page, the next service, yes. the next person you meet might be the one that God's got for you. Amen. Don't give up. Amen. It takes stickability. Yes. Let's read our text today. Galatians chapter 6. And we're going to read from verse 7 through 10. If you haven't got a Bible, just listen along. He says these words. Do not be deceived. Now that implies we can be deceived as Christians. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man, that's the word man means mankind, male or female. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh, the old carnal nature, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit, will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. And this is the bit I like. Especially to those who are of the household of faith. That means you and I. That means them sat next to you. The household of faith, especially, especially, more than. As you have opportunity. See, I believe the church, as the, the congregations, we don't take the opportunity to encourage one another as much as we should. When we first got saved, they had to, they had to take us aside and tell us to go home. Because we wanted everything. And we took our Wendy, and she was only a baby, a little baby, and we had a little cagoule, you know, a carry thing. And, and that used to come with us. We was when the church was old, we was and we wanted everything. And we had to be told, you're coming too much. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine us saying, look, you know. I think you're coming a bit too much. Have a break. It's usually the opposite, isn't it? It's usually like pulling teeth, getting people to come. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. And this scripture is telling us, hold on. He says, let us not grow weary. You ever grown weary? Sometimes, it, you know, it's wearing us out. And it's not, listen, it's not always big events. It tells you in the Old Testament that it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Yeah. It's those insignificant things that wear us out, wear us down. Don't grow, grow weary while doing good, while trying to live for Christ. Because the word of God promises that in due season, the due season means the right season, the right time. Yeah. See, we always want to harvest in spring. It doesn't work, does it? Uh, we, I take great delight in, in, in this time of the year. 
we were walking around the other day and seeing all the the uh, buds of the daffodils coming through round round with it. And I'm saying, look at that, Denise. It's getting spring, it's coming. It's a promise of better things, isn't it? Yes. Due season. Don't try and reap in spring, amen. Have patience, wait, wait on God. Do you not think God knows your situation? Do you not think God knows what you're going through? God's timing is perfect. He's never early, he's never late. So, first of all this morning, God wants to bless you. Yes. You can say amen to that. God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. Now, this kind of language in the church is sometimes, and I fell for it sometimes, where we, we overemphasize on such things as prosperity, healing. You know, I believe in healing, but people are dying, aren't they? Jean died and Dorothy died. But that's not the end of the story, is it? Yeah. Yeah. We're all going to die. Hopefully not today. We've got to not get a mentality where God becomes a vending machine, handing yeah. yes. out health and wealth to anybody who desires it for their own benefit. Yes. But after saying all that, God does want to bless us. Yeah. He does want to bless us. He is blessing us. Because we serve a God who blesses. And God blesses big. God blesses abundantly. And the Bible, if you read it, will find out that it's full of that, that kind of, um, it gives evidence of that kind of thing. Yes, uh, there will be suffering. You may have to endure persecution because of our faith. But listen to this. God promises that either here and now or then and there in eternity you will inherit unimaginable blessings from God. I can't wait. I can't wait to, to be in the presence of God. Be in the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. In eternity. And imagine the things that God's got for us. Jesus. I've been reading some testimonies of people who, who've experienced um, coming back from the dead, mm -hmm. spending time in heaven and places like that. Mm -hmm. And every one of them's got a different experience, and that's okay. But some of the things I just thought, oh, I can't wait for that. You know, being a, an ex-bus driver, you know, at least, you know, in, in heaven they say, you just think of it and you're there. Yeah. Imagine travelling and you're there. No waiting for buses. <laughs> <coughs> Revelation tells us that the tree of life is there. And its fruit is the healing and the leaves of the healing of the nations. Guess what? We know God wants to bless us, but this is a big one. God wants to bless you in His time. Amen. That's where a lot of us get tripped up. We love the idea of receiving God's blessing in our lives, but we hesitate to embrace His timing. This is where a lot of Believers fall and lose heart because it's not coming their timetable. See, we just waited another day, another prayer. The answer was coming.
And so to inherit God's best blessing is God's best timing. And in the meantime, keep giving him our best life. I remember meeting a, a young man we used to know, and he was very extrovert. He was always, you know, I, I remember we used to come in down um, the new road on Earlham and the Heights, and there used to be a bridge going across. And he'd be, he'd be there every morning and every night in peak hour, and he'd hang over the bridge with banners and, you know, telling them. He had to stop in there because he was distracting all the drivers. And, I mean, the sad thing is, his own life didn't live up to it. And I remember bumping into him in the, in the shop in the queue. And he started telling me, you know. And I, saw, I could see the deterioration that had happened in his life. He turned to the drink. And I don't know what else. And he turned around to me in the queue and he said, how are you doing? And... Straight away, he felt guilty. Not nothing I said. But he just felt guilty. And he began making excuses. Well, I didn't even know he'd done all this. And he, he started telling me. And, you know, he said, oh, you know, in the end, I realised that uh, this born again stuff didn't work for me. And I said, well, it certainly worked for me. But it's not, you know, it's not three steps to heaven. It's living the life and holding on and believing God. I don't know where he is today, but you know, I'd like to believe he, God got hold of him somewhere. I've not seen him since. But the problem was he wouldn't wait for God. For whatever he was going through in his life didn't come the way he thought it would come and the time that he thought he should do it now. See, we live in a very impatient society. We want it and we want it now. We want it yesterday. Give God time to do what he's doing. Oh, my family are sick. Give God time. I mean, some of my family have died. Still give God time. You know, the beautiful thing is, and I was telling people this at the funeral, Death to us is like going out of the living room into the kitchen. This life and the next life is like going into another room. And it's instant. I remember meditating on this thing that the scripture says that to God, a day is like a thousand years. Amen. And a thousand years is like a day. Yeah. And I was looking at it because people are using it in prophecy. And they're saying, oh, well, a day is like a thousand years. So, you know, the six days of creation is six. We all know that. But, and, and then they start saying, well, Jesus is coming back because, you know, 300 and or 3,000 so many days. And, you know, he's so many years. And, and they're actually making it what it's not saying. And as I began to meditate on a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. God's simply saying, with God, there's no time. Yeah. That's all he's saying. Yeah. With God, there's no time. To us, we might think, oh, well, my wife or my husband or, or my child, whoever we've lost, it's been 10, 15 years. But when we step over that line into eternity, they've not been waiting 15 years. There's no time. See, to inherit God's best blessing, we want his best time. <coughs> Learn to think God knows best. Because if we start doubting God's timing and God's blessing, we start thinking God don't like us. Jesus. Why did he do this? Why is he allowed this? And this is one of the things that my sisters came up with at the hospital. We were talking about prayer and healing. And 
And she said to me, I'm Denise, I find it hard to pray. This is a non-believer, as we understand. I find it hard to pray because, you know, for, for my brother Alan, who's in hospital. Because I pray for my other brothers and they all died. And then we began to explain about God's timing. God's working. Being patient. And I said to her, do you think we're all going to die? Oh, of course. So I said, well, why is it such a big thing then? Don't get me wrong, bereavement is a, is a big thing. But kind of, as you get more into, uh, older and you, you, know, you have more funerals, you've got to train your brain to understand what's going on. The end of life for us is not the end. You say it in Star Trek, didn't you? This is life, but not as we know it. So what I'm trying to say, folks, in our situations, in our desires, don't get ahead of God. Because you know what happens when we get ahead of God? When we pray to God about something. And instead of patiently waiting and being productive for God, he trusted him. Trusting that he's faithful to provide. Guess what? When you lose patience, we try and get ahead of God. We can quickly step in and try and to figure it out ourselves. I've done that loads of times. We make ourselves believe God's leading us, but really, we're trying to lead God. We want it happening. We get essentially get ahead of God. And this is when you and I, we focus on what we want to happen. Or whatever it is we don't have yet. I remember one one uh, older man when, uh, many years ago, he's in glory now. But he began, God began to show me through different people and myself some of the wacky ways we think. He said one day, he, he, was, he, he was right at the end of, you know, anyone remember the three-wheeler cars? Oh, yeah. The Robin Reliant, oh, yeah. made of fiberglass. Yeah. How it ever stayed on the road, I don't know. Well, he had one of these. And um, he was telling me the tale how he got it. He said, you know what? He said he thought he was being... Well, he may have been being spiritual. I, I didn't think he was. He said, you know, I said to God, I don't know what car to get. Well, I'm going to go to the Reliant, Robin Reliant garage in Bolton. And if they've got a yellow one, I know it's you. <laughs> and I'm going to get it. And he got it. Now, really, I'm thinking, what are the odds that that dealership going to have multi-colours. So he could have picked a blue or a red, and the odds are they would have had one. So he got a yellow one. Let me tell you, it's a death trap. When his wife drove it. She doesn't really drive. But she used to live in Caddyshead. And uh, one day, his wife gave Denise a lift <laughs> home. And, he's, you know, she, she'd come back. To, we lived at Brook House, and wide eyes. She said, oh, she terrified me. 
because she wasn't used to driving the clutch and everything, and, and the wind had taken it, and, you know, and she gets a patty craft bridge and it was, <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you all this. When we won't wait for what God, we've asked God to do in our lives. And I think that was one occasion where he, he got ahead of God. And, and the worst thing is, because he told everyone it was God, he had to stick with it. <laughs> and he had it for years. <laughs> God bless him. See, but while we're waiting and we get impatient, we take our eyes off God. We take our focus off God and we start thinking what we can do to, re, to yield the result we want. That's why sometimes we get the wrong jobs, we get the wrong partner, we get the wrong whatever it is. Because we, we wouldn't wait. We wouldn't wait on what God was going to show us. See, we wisely bring our prayers to God. But because of little faith and wrong focus, we quickly take it back. And we take it upon ourselves to find a solution. Now, you all know this story, hopefully. It's in Genesis chapter 16. And there you'll find the story of Abraham and Sarah. Do, you know, in their old days, they wanted to fulfil the promise that God would give to them to become the father of a nation or nations. And so, in this story, you find one of Sarah's maid servants, Hagar, was young, and they wasn't able to be blessed with children. And it was Hagar that said to Abraham, take my servant, Hagar, and perhaps sh she can bring us children. <coughs> Here we're getting ahead of God now. Yeah. They couldn't wait on the promise, mm -hmm. so they did it to human understanding. We need to help God a little bit here. So take my maid servant, Hagar, and go and produce children with her, which he did. But guess what? Because she got pregnant, and, she, and, and Sarah couldn't, pride rose up in her. I'm having a baby with Abraham, you can't have any. And she began to mock her, to mock her, 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 her owner. You know the story, it caused umpteen kinds of fights, and you know. And she, she eventually had the baby and called him Ishmael. Now, that one decision is still affecting you and I today because Ishmael became the, the, the leader of the nation of Islam, Arabs, and different things like that. And even today, there's still conflict. There's still conflict with it. Arab states and Israel, they're still fighting because of that decision. Because they wouldn't wait. I know you wouldn't do that. I know you wouldn't wait. get ahead of God. There's another story in Exodus 32, starting at verse 1. Listen to this, he says, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, he'd gone up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And the people got impatient because he'd been up the mountain longer than they expected. He said, so the, the people gathered together and got the, the, the deputy leader, Aaron, and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall be, go before us. 
For as for this Moses, if you can hear it in that, as for this Moses fella, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know where or what has become of him. And so they got impatient. And they made the golden calf. They, they all melted all the gold rings and everything and they made the golden calf. God wasn't happy with that. Moses wasn't happy with that. In fact, he smashed the stones on the way down. And that's just two illustrations of how getting ahead of God, of having impatience in your life. I used to laugh when uh, Peter and you know, when they began to get computer games. And remember when Mario was the hit thing, Mario? Yeah. And it used to tickle me because, I forget how it did, but if they took too long or they, they didn't do what they were supposed to do, little Mario used to come on and go, <laughs> was impatient. I kind of, we get like that, don't we? I've told you before, I can't wait for the bus. I used to drive them, but I can't wait for the bus. And I start walking to the next stop. And you can guarantee when they get in the middle, the bus goes past. Getting ahead of God. So what happens when you and I do this? Primarily, guess what? God just leads you to it. God will let you do it. And it means you and I risk falling on our face, being embarrassed, taking on prolonged and negative consequences, and even causing the negative consequences. For our entire household, for our families. But one thing God doesn't tolerate with us is our pride. But God will simply allow us to go ahead with our plans. And read whatever comes out. My mother used to say, you've made your bed, you can lie in it. You've probably heard that saying. You've made your bed, you can lie in it. You can live with the consequences of your bad decisions. That's how God is with you and I. He didn't want us to do it. He'd try and lead and guide us. But in our stubbornness, if we carry on with it, okay, go ahead. I remember when the kids were little, we used to have, I don't know, I've not seen them lately because most people have said to me, <laughs> but we used to have the grate around the fire. The, the, the fire guard. The fire guard, yeah. And that used to get hot, you know, but remember you've all had kids, hot, Bernie Bernie, don't touch, Bernie Bernie. And when you weren't lucky to put their hand on it and scream. And we used to say, now you've learned the lesson. Bernie, Bernie, no, no, no. That's the consequences of your disobedience. See, our decisions, folks, have consequences. And as we fall on our faces... In whatever we're trying to accomplish on our own, we can then come to God and seek His direction. And guess what? He'll, he'll surely help us. Because our God is, the Bible tells us, He's full of grace, He's full of mercy, and He's full of forgiveness. Amen. Even though He's left you to your own means, when you come Jesus. trying to God, forgive you 
He'll be, he was looking all the time. He was watching all the time. Amen. And even when we make the mistakes, I believe God will require us to patiently wait for him to put the pieces back together. Yes, amen. Amen. When we make those mistakes, when we make a mess of things, yeah. God's still waiting. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Like Mario tapping his foot, <laughs> waiting for us to come to him, say, It's me, Lord, I've messed up. Yes. I tried it my way. Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. So why don't we just patiently wait for God? Let God work in our prayers, on our prayers. In the first place, right? Let's try and bring it to a close. Three big secrets to living a life content with God's blessing and God's timing. Number one is live to please Him. Amen. Live to please God. Remember we said the other week in the 70s, we used to give all the, the, the young people then wristbands, what would Jesus do? Think about it. What, what, what would God want me to do in this situation? Yes. Well, if you're in the Word, you'll find out. Amen. And He'll speak to you. Number two is live to serve others. And number three is live for long term payoffs. Don't be like the world. We want it and we want it now. We want it and we want it now. That's how we get you into the debt trap. When they started bringing it out in the, in the 70s, easy debt they used to call it. And it's even easier now. There's places you can go in and they'll, 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 give, you, they'll give you a loan on the price of your car. Jesus. They'll give you a loan on the price of your TV. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. Easy money. Yeah. It's not so easy when people have to pay it back. So, yes, let's say, God, give me patience. You know, I've got a sermon entitled, Lord, give me patience, but hurry up. Because that's what I'm most of the time. We think we're being patient, but we're getting ahead of God. God knew your situation. God knows your situation. God knows his, what he wants to do in your life or their life. See, godly resilience is patiently and consistently serving others. You think about it, the gospel's all about serving others, isn't it? God so loved the world, not just you. We're doing it for his sake. While waiting on him to bless us. In his time and his way. One of the things we've taught people over the years is when you're going through things, go and visit someone, do something good, go and help somebody. In other words, go and serve. While you're waiting, serve. Some of you might have needs from God, but you're too timid to ask. But I want you to start asking in faith today. Say, Lord, teach me how to wait. I need a wife, I need a husband, I need a job, I need a, a house or whatever it is. And I'm bringing it before your throne of grace. Teach me how to wait patiently. Do you think, you're not going to take God by surprise. Even when you fail, God's there, he's waiting. There might be things that you've also expected and demanded of God. 
But we've refused to accept his timing. I want it now. And one of the things I've saw over the years is, is with Anthony and Maria and, and Peter and Linda, how that patience had to come in. Five years, a long time to wait to get the answer to what you wanted. It's frustration. And all we can say is, hold on. You're on the brink of a miracle. You're just on the next page. God's going to answer your prayer. Don't give up. Don't give up on your desires. Don't give up on your prayers. Don't give up on your dreams. See, sometimes we it doesn't work out for us because like Abraham and Sarah and the people of Moses, they got ahead of God. Yes. They thought God had fell asleep, so you know we're gonna invent our own gods. Mm -hmm. We're gonna worship them. We do it all the time, don't we? Please decide today to wait. You can do it. And I'm speaking to me as well. Kind of get impatient. I, I know some of you are the same. I can't, I can't sit around the house. I think, oh, we're off tomorrow, which is a rare thing. And I'll say, we'll have a lie-in, but I'm still up at seven. Yeah. And by eight o'clock, I'm saying this, come on, get ready. We'll go and get a coffee. <laughs> we'll go to Tesco's. We'll do this, we'll do that. I can't sit around the house. The odd occasion I can. Decide to wait on God. And during that time of waiting for, you can keep giving your best at work. You can keep giving your best to your spouse. You can keep giving your best to your kids. You can keep giving your best to your church. You can keep giving your best to your neighbours. And that's why it's called choosing resilience when you feel like giving up. Yes. Isn't it funny? It's only when we go through things that God seems to challenge us. Believe in hope when there's no hope. Choosing resilience, patience, waiting on God. When you don't feel like it, when you feel like giving up, when you feel like everything's against you. That's the time God wants you to do it. Yes. That's the time faith kicks in. That's the time to say, God, I'm going to patiently wait on you. Yes. Guess what? God will do it. Amen. Amen. God will do it. He's done it for all of us. God will do it. Amen. I'm going to keep saying it until I hear that big amen. amen. God will do it. Amen. There you go. Now we're free to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you for coming. Choosing resilience when you feel like giving up. Don't give up. You're on the brink of a miracle. We do invite you to stay for coffee and tea and biscuits in the next room. Come and say hello, even if you can't stay. Just say hello to somebody needs to shake your hand and give you a hug. Or you give them up. Don't forget tomorrow is um, Jean's funeral at 2.20 at Salford, Salford Acecroft. And uh, don't worry if you can't make it. Those that do, let's just encourage your family if you can. God bless you. Thank you for coming out. Give Jesus a big hand. Amen.